I'm Mike Cohen. I'm an associate professor at the Donders Institute for Medical Neuroscience in the Netherlands. And I'm going to present a method, this is a novel algorithm, for identifying empirical frequency boundaries in multi-channel electrophysiology data, and therefore in cross-scale data sets. I am very interested in trying to understand the nature of the dynamics across different scales in brain activity, across different temporal scales and across different spatial scales. It turns out that cross-scale interaction research, so doing this kind of research, is quite challenging. It's, it's quite difficult. There are many reasons why it is difficult, and I'm going to outline a few of the major challenges of implementing successful cross-scale interaction research before presenting the novel algorithm that I think will address at least uh, some of these challenges. One challenge is in simply acquiring data simultaneously across multiple spatial scales. So something like recording EEG and LFP and spikes simultaneously. This is certainly not impossible. There are many great labs around the world who are beginning to collect these kinds of data, but it is still quite difficult. It is technically demanding and most research labs, certainly not all, but most neuroscience research labs are focused specifically on one spatial scale. So for example, dendrites or only measuring EEG or something like that. But fortunately, the technology is improving rapidly and this is allowing us to record more and more data simultaneously from the brain. For example, here is a plot showing the number of simultaneously recorded neurons, so basically a measure of the data set size, the multivariate data set size, and you can see this appears to double about every seven and a half years or so over the past half century. So collecting cross-scale data is challenging, but this is getting better over time. Now we are also lacking some really great theories, really specific theories that will help us know what to predict and how to interpret our results of cross-scale interaction data analyses. Now, neuroscience is not entirely an empirical science, but it is dominated by empirical research, and that's because, yeah, we still have a lot more to learn about how the brain works before we can get to a level of theoretical sophistication that exists, for example, in physics. Fortunately, though, we are also improving in this aspect. And by we, I mean the, the neuroscience community in general. So there is increasingly some very detailed work, including this very beautiful paper that came out recently, that is helping us work towards mathematically defined theories and therefore better falsifiable hypotheses that we can then empirically test in data. Another challenge of cross-scale interaction research is the data analysis methods. Now here the issue is that most of the analyses, the statistical and data analysis methods that are used in neuroscience come from a long history of traditional univariate analyses. Now traditional univariate analyses are fine, but arguably they are not suitable for the kinds of large-scale, multivariate, and multi-scale, so really high-dimensional data sets that we are beginning to acquire. There are several reasons for this claim. One is that uh, mass univariate and also even bivariate analyses, they tend to run into statistical issues like multiple comparisons issues, for example. Secondly, to the extent that neural computations are distributed across different neurons, across different circuits in the brain, then recording data and focusing the analyses on individual neurons or individual electrodes or individual voxels or pixels may lead to poor SNR and poor estimations of the actual underlying neural computations, assuming those computations are spatially distributed, which is something we increasingly believe in neuroscience. Another source of challenges in cross-scale interaction research is variability of oscillations, and this is something that interests me in particular, and this is the primary motivation for the algorithm that I will present in the rest of my talk. So neural oscillations are a very prominent feature of the data. They're also a very useful foothold of the data, of neuroscience data, for linking dynamics across multiple spatial and temporal scales. 
So here you see a plot showing power spectra. So this is frequency on the x-axis, power on the y-axis. The black thick line here corresponds to the average from one particular electrode over a group of individuals. But when you look at the individual power spectra, you see that there is a lot of variability. So not only variability in terms of power, but also in terms of the frequency, the peak frequency, and the bandwidth of these oscillations. Now, mostly in the neuroscience literature, people select a frequency range typically based on integers, so 8 to 12 hertz, for example, and just use that common window as a frequency range for every single individual. I think, however, this variability should be leveraged. We should try to take advantage of this variability over different subjects. And then the final challenge of doing cross-scale research is that there are many sources of noise in neural data. And the characteristics of the noise may depend on the spatial scale. Fortunately, however, multivariate data analysis methods allow us to leverage weak correlational patterns across many different channels in order to enhance the signal-to-noise ratio. And here you see a simple example of this. This is with simulated data, so we know what the ground truth is. And this shows the distribution of simulated 10 hertz activity. So this is from the, the data simulation. And this shows the power at the electrode level. Now, you don't really see a good reconstruction due to excessive noise. And that's the black power spectrum. You barely see a peak in the, you know, around 10 hertz over here. However, by applying special multivariate techniques, we can leverage the correlational structure across the different simulated EEG electrodes to vastly improve the signal-to-noise ratio and discover a feature of the data that is present but might be difficult to observe when only plotting the results from an individual data channel. So this really relies on a technique called spatial filtering for trying to do source separation or unmixing sources. Again, the idea is that there are patterns of correlations that are distributed across multiple EEG electrodes, although these the methods I will present are general. They can be applied to any spatial scale or really any kind of time series data, multivariate time series data, where oscillations can be expected. And so we take all of the data from the individual channels and we compute the weighted sum over all of the channels. And the idea is that the component that results from this weighted combination of the data channels highlights some specific feature of the data that is distributed across all of the electrodes and is therefore only very weak at individual electrodes but can be much more robust when we consider the weighted average over all of the electrodes. Okay, so the goals of this study were to develop an automatic algorithm that can identify empirical frequency boundaries based on covariance structures, narrow band covariance structures in multi-channel data. After explaining how the algorithm works, then I'm going to show you some validations in simulated EEG data, and then I'm going to show you an application of this algorithm to a publicly available data set, and that is some resting state EEG data in Parkinson's patients. Okay, so now I'm going to walk you through how this algorithm works. I call this GED bounds. This stands for Generalized Eigen Decomposition Based Boundaries. So the first step of this algorithm is to create two covariance matrices from the data. One covariance matrix is based on the broadband data, so non-temporally filtered data. And another covariance matrix is based on narrowband filtered EEG data. So you see here, this is a depiction of broadband data. So X would be the data matrix. And we create a channel by channel covariance matrix. Here is exactly the same data. So these, this data matrix is taken from the same individual, the same electrodes, the same time windows, the same task. Everything is the same. It's just that this is, is non-temporally filtered and this is narrowband filtered at a particular frequency. So then we get our two covariance matrices here. The next step is to compute something called a generalized eigen decomposition on these two covariance matrices. Now, in a few moments, I'm going to explain why generalized eigen decomposition is the right thing to do here. I'm gonna justify that analysis choice. But for now, suffice it to say, 
that the result of the generalized eigen decomposition is a set of eigenvectors and corresponding eigenvalues, and the interpretation of these eigenvectors is that they maximally separate the covariance matrix S from covariance matrix R. In other words, the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue will identify, will isolate a pattern, a spatial pattern in the data, such that the weighted combination of data channels maximizes the energy or the power of the narrowband filtered signal compared to the broadband filtered signal. Okay, so we take that uh, eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue, and we store that for one frequency, for example, 4 hertz. And then we repeat this procedure, where this covariance matrix is the same for all these frequencies, and this narrowband filtered covariance matrix is different, uh, and then you can, you know, select whichever frequency ranges you like. In this case, I went from uh, 2 hertz up to 80 hertz. Now, once you get this collection of eigenvectors over all of these different frequencies, you correlate them. So this is a matrix of all of the correlations between the eigenvectors at different frequencies. So just to be clear, you repeat this for many frequencies, then this pixel here, the color value at this pixel, is the correlation between the eigenvector at 20 hertz and the eigenvector at 6.8 hertz, or you know, whatever these frequencies are. So then you can uh, see this correlation matrix here. Remarkably, the correlation matrix becomes organized into a block diagonal-like structure. And the interpretation is that all of these dark values here are highly correlated eigenvectors. So that means that the spatial temporal characteristics of the multi-channel data are very similar in this frequency range, and these frequencies are collectively very dissimilar from all the other frequencies that I extracted here. So after identifying uh, or computing this uh, correlation matrix, this eigenvectors correlation matrix, the next step is to apply a clustering method called dbscan that will identify the clusters in this matrix, and that you see outlined in pink here. So these um, pink boxes are the result of the dbscan clustering. So now each of these clusters corresponds to an empirical frequency, and this is great because we do not need to specify a priori the boundaries of the frequency bands. The frequency boundaries are just extracted automatically through this procedure. Okay, and so that's the algorithm. In brief, what I'm going to do now is take a moment to explain why a generalized eigen decomposition is the right thing to do. And that's also going to help you understand why this algorithm is useful. So our objective here, our goal, is to identify a spatial filter in W, so a vector of filters for each data channel, such that the weighted combination of, uh, of data channels, which gives us a component time series, has more energy for the narrowband signal relative to the broadband signal. So this would be the variance or the norm of the narrowband signal, and this is the variance or the norm of the broadband signal. So we want to choose a vector w that maximizes this ratio here. So how do we go about solving that? Well, we start by rewriting this term as the dot product of this vector, this vector matrix product, with itself. So that looks like this. And then we apply you know, a little bit of uh, standard linear algebra, and we end up with W transpose. And then the key terms here are in the middle, X times X transpose. Now this turns out to be the covariance matrix of the filtered signal and the covariance matrix of the broadband signal. So we can rewrite this to be S, and rewrite this to be R. I choose these letters because S is for the signal that we want to enhance, and R is for a reference that we want to enhance against. So what we are doing here is trying to identify a vector of weights, which we treat as a spatial filter that maximizes this ratio here, which is sometimes called the generalized Rayleigh coefficient. It can also be rewritten uh, using uh, this notation. Okay, now this doesn't actually tell us how we get the w's, this just re-expresses this form into a slightly different picture. So it turns out that the solution to finding the, uh, the w, the weight vector that maximizes this ratio here, 
And by the way, it's a very slight uh, abuse of mathematical notation, but this indicates that when we find our W max, we can plug in W max to this equation. This whole thing boils down to a single number, so one scalar, which reflects the power ratio, and, uh, and we can call that lambda. Anyway, the solution comes from uh, considering not a single uh, vector w, but instead a matrix of solutions w. So all these vectors turn into matrices, and yeah, we can also apply a little bit of uh, linear algebra here. And we get to an expression like this, which turns out to be an eigenvalue decomposition on the matrix product R inverse times S. And then, yeah, you can also uh, put the R on, on this side instead of worrying about the uh, explicitly computing the inverse of, X, of R, which we don't actually need to do. So this is called the generalized eigen decomposition. Here you see some results in a validation study. So here I simulated the data, so I know what the, what the ground truth result is. The red dashed line here shows the simulated result, so this is the ground truth, and the black and the purple outline show the result of the method. So you can see that this method, this algorithm, JetBounds, does a really good job at recovering the ground truth data. Now it's a little bit smeared due to the leakage from the spectral filter. In principle, we could, you know, I, I could have made that a little bit tighter and gotten this a little bit closer. But actually, in real neural data, particularly in EEG data, it is beneficial to add a little bit of spectral smoothing. So this is a pretty realistic scenario. Up here in the top row, you see the ground truth from the simulated data. Here you see the empirical maps resulting from the result of the JetBounds algorithm. And this shows the uh, actual eigenvectors, which are more spatially selective compared to the uh, component maps here. So it works quite well in data simulations, but you know, on the other hand, we can always create the simulations to, to, to have low noise and high signal energy and, and you know, get the results to work. Here you see some results in empirical data. So this is a resting state EEG data set where we don't actually know the ground truth, but these results do look pretty sensible. So we see some very low frequency components which appear to be blink artifacts or eye movement artifacts. Here we see something that looks like theta. This is the alpha component, maybe a second alpha component in a slightly higher frequency and so on. I also applied this analysis method to a group of Parkinson's patients and matched controls. In the interest of time, I think I'm not going to go into detail about this, but you can read more about this in the paper if you are curious. So, in conclusion, spatial temporal structure in multi-channel data can be leveraged to identify components in the brain which we interpret as reflecting statistical sources in the EEG data, in the multivariate data. These decompositions or multivariate decompositions are advantageous over single trial analyses due to source mixing and also due to reduced signal to noise characteristics at the single channel level. Uh, I think this is a, a nice empirical method. It can help us identify individual variation in brain oscillation frequency and other characteristics, including uh, the bandwidth. And this method in principle works for any multivariate data sets. I, I'm not showing this here, but I've also tried this method on data from simultaneously recorded LFP and EEG signals, and it also works quite well in mixed scale data.